Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So we wanted to bring you a special episode today uh, because Mm -hmm. there's been a lot of really important recent Jung Mm -hmm. scholarship. You know, there's, I mean, the Philemon Foundation has been bringing unpublished works to light. We've now heard this really exciting news about the critical edition that's being published. It's, It's really so great. And I was fortunate enough, or we were fortunate enough actually recently to speak with one of Jung's biographers. And there's some really interesting stuff that's coming to light that we did not know before about mm. him. So I want to share, first of all, this is, um, this is from an older biography, but apparently when Jung was at Bollingen, which was his tower that he built on the lake, he would wake up at seven and then he would say, good morning to his saucepans, pots, and frying pans. Hmm. So apparently he would actually talk to these items as if they were in sold. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's come to light actually, interestingly, that Marie Kondo, the Japanese maven of tidying, Hmm. um, may have really kind of been very inspired by Jung. Because she also, if you recall, recommends talking to objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to explore today this notion of animism uh, and and what we're what we're learning about Jung and his relationship with the material in the physical world. Well, I had not heard uh, that Kondo had a relationship with um, Jung's material, although it doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, because her whole process of having a relationship, or at least admitting that you have a relationship mm-hmm. to the objects that you collect, mm-hmm. and that it's deep and soulful and psychological, is absolutely Jungian. Yeah. Of course, it has something to do with typology as well. But I was thinking also about Jung's, the way he rested into animism, uh, which for those who may yeah. be new to the term, is mm-hmm. the feeling that there is a living quality to all objects, a kind of universal soul that he extended, of course, into his kitchen objects and appliances, and that he had very specific relationships to the various objects in the kitchen. And and what it often reminds me of is in Beauty and the Beast, where all of the objects Mm -hmm. in the cartoon begin to sing Mm -hmm. and speak, and they have personalities Mm -hmm. in, in a way that children experience objects in very similar ways. Mm -hmm. It it ties in with so much Mm -hmm. of Jung's theory and work around the collective unconscious, synchronicity, um, that there's a substrate that connects all of us and the world, uh, the world soul, the world tree, um, you know, all kinds of uh, traditions believe that things are ensouled and that we are a part of something greater all the time. And I mean, I imagine lest people take this too terribly literally, you know, that you know, Jung didn't believe that the pots and pans were literally alive, but that there was a quality of relational connection uh, and a separateness and an ensouled quality. Uh, to his world, Absolutely. even mundane things, right? Absolutely. And what's coming mm-hmm. forward in this in this new scholarship is that Jung. Th- this is not well known, but uh, but you know it's it's coming to light that he had a substantial collection of beer steins, and that each one <gasps> of these had a name. Oh, uh, 
and that he he had lengthy conversations with them daily. He kept them in a cabinet in his consulting room and would consult with them after the patient left. So it was kind of like an active imagination with the beer signs. And a lot of those beer signs, uh, for listeners who are maybe not familiar with them, but uh, are beautifully wrought with all kinds of you know, the ceramics are raised and there are faces on them. Yeah. They have real personalities. So it's a, it's a wonderful um, choice for projecting, interacting, active imagining, dialoguing uh, that, that Jung could readily avail himself of. Well, also at the time that Jung was alive, it was very common to get a souvenir beer stein from, say, a certain Mm -hmm. town that you travel to. So, you know, he would, when he was in London lecturing, he got, you know, a a souvenir beer stein from Mm -hmm. a a pub in London. You know, when he was uh, in Ravenna, he got, he, there's a beer stein from Ravenna. And of course, uh, there's one from Vienna when he was there, you know, visiting Freud. Yeah. Uh, And, And many other places too. So. And the, uh, the you know those you know those kind of souvenir beer steins they feature oh, like yeah. you know the, 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 there's a big Ben image on the London beer stein and and you know that kind of thing so yeah they're a little kitschy but uh, mm-hmm. well one of the things that I was um, reflecting on when you were talking about the beer steins is a story about one particular beer stein that Jung would keep in his table. And sometimes Mm. later in life, his nurse used to have to wrestle out of his hands because he was so Mm. attached to it. And it was one of the steins that had a bear on it and a kind of legendary bear Mm. figure. I'm, I'm trying to bring back the nickname that he had for the bear, but um, the nurse would come in and see him cuddling it and talking to it. Uh, she was. Mm. She would lean into the door and listen carefully at what he was whispering to the bear Stein, but um, mm-hmm. clearly it had something to do with that later work that he was developing in alchemy. It had something to do with the integration of his own instinctive nature, and that he seemed to be speaking in very loving ways. And I think in one mm-hmm. of the stories, speaking to the bear sign as if it was a lover in and of itself. Mm. Well, that builds on what he had done in his earlier years at Bolingen, uh, that Lisa, you and I could see where he had carved a bear uh, into the stone uh, mm-hmm. on the side of the house. So clearly, you know, bears are mythological in so many ways and have such depth and primal power. Um, that that Stein and the symbol of the bear, as you know, Jung had reached a stage where he was very aged. Uh, he, he was sinking into a, a mythological realm that was ensouled and animated, as as bears had been for him throughout his life. The, the name, I believe, for the inner figure was called Angela. I'm not pronouncing mm. it right. I'm sure mm. there's some mm. German version uh, of it. Angela, Angela. Angela, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. That Angela the Bearstein was something that became a significant figure towards the end of his life. There are no accounts that he was, in fact, dreaming of this. But um, really, in about the last five years of his life, he would not be parted from the Bearstein. And he insisted that every beverage that he was served, mm. in essence, be served by Angela. Mm. Uh, it was such an intimate relationship. Mm. That's so touching. And it, it oh, really, I, I, it yeah, is it's very moving. It's very it really moving. is. It, it says something, you know, that, that, that this, this Bierstein collection uh, was important to him throughout the, his lifespan because, you know, he started the collection as a as a young man and it, it really was meaningful to him throughout throughout his his life. And I, I think it's so interesting that it's not mentioned anywhere in Memories, mm-hmm. Dreams, Reflections. And 
you, you know, that they're looking at the protocols now, the original protocols for memory streams mm-hmm. reflections, which is just more fascinating young scholarship. It's such a great time to be in this world because there's so much st- exciting stuff happening. But what they yeah. speculate yeah. is that his his attachment to his Bierstein collection was too tender to be put in his autobiography. Too intimate. Yeah. And, and there are some yeah. things that have to be kept just for oneself. Right. Yeah. But, it's, you know, what I'm thinking about is uh, how the, some of this information, uh, like so much of the material, uh, that later became the published version of the Red Book, of all places, is found in the basement of the Yale University Library. Right. Is that amazing? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not, I wonder how on earth did it get from Switzerland, you know, all the way across the Atlantic, and then wind up in what I imagine are these caverns of, of archaeological information. Deb? Are the beer steins themselves at Yale? Do you know, or is it? It's is it just more of the you know kind of like written material? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. My, it's written material, and I imagine you know that the young family has carefully sequestered yeah uh, these steins. But but I also just want to lift up that it's so in keeping with Jung's. Uh, bedrock theory about how we have to personify yeah absolutely images that the that the archetypes are kind of up here in a vague way and we bring them down uh to an image we can see and relate mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. uh so that we can explore our own inner selves in relation to this image well and of course if you think about the shape of a beer stein it's mm-hmm. it's it's concave you know like a it's like a vessel so it it's like vessel. the alchemical vase mm-hmm. but it's also so feminine and containing you know mm-hmm. it's like a it's like a womb you yeah know? it's it is an incredible um real union of the opposites of yeah. the of you know the archetypes of masculine and feminine which are not the same as genders but they're like yin and yang or eros and logos. And here is a union of the opposites that you literally can get a handle on. Yeah, yeah. And, and then there is the magical beverage. Of course, you can drink anything, but um, what's beer? They're yeah. beer steins. Yeah. And that, that magical process of transforming hops and other ingredients into uh, this transporting beverage that can it's, change your it's mood. all chemical. <laughs> right? That's it. That's it's exactly. Like, it's like the aqua permanence. And That's thinking ex- about your wow. blending that beer signs, some of them can be 12, 14 inches long. I mean, they're mm. really substantive. So they're Ooh. both phallic and feminine. Ooh, yes. So they're both mm. containing as well as being a kind they of can be really pillar, big. a kind of totem. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. There really works. Uh, of art that are substantive. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, that's a really good point. You know, one of the things that also, uh, you know, uh, is being revealed is that, uh, you know, when Jung, at the beginning of his confrontation with the unconscious, when there were some kind of parapsychological mm-hmm. things going on, and we've talked about that before on the podcast, one of them actually occurred around the Bierstein. So the beer stein was sitting on, he had it in, um, in mm-hmm. a special room, you know, in, in his, um, in his consulting room in the cupboard. And he, and he had this, uh, this particular, um, meeting with an analysand. He didn't say who it was, but there was a loud noise that occurred during the session. And when he opened up mm. the cupboard, you know, it was like the knife, the beer stein had shattered. Oh, Wow. <gasps> Yeah, wow. so it's like there was something really psychologically active in that session, and so you know that's a that's a that's another really kind of fascinating thing, right? That these mm-hmm. were so invested with his psychic mm-hmm. material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, and it matters to us, doesn't it, that we can find these personal details of of Jung's life and. Um, so that we can really imagine him more as a man and 
uh, don't we always want to know really what was this person like and uh, these personal kinds of of details. But I remember seeing some of the beer steins on that shelf uh, in his office, Lisa. He must, some of them he kept in a cupboard, I guess, but there, there was a whole row of them right there on his, in his study that at the time before this material had come up uh, and come to light recently, I just thought was, you know, he was German Swiss. And so he right, had some, right. some tchotchkes like on beer, his shelf. Yes. <laughs> but, but of course, I should have thought about this, that for Jung, it would have had to have been significant. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that we've also been reading about is that Jung experienced something called synesthesia, which is ah. this very interesting phenomena where the psyche is so fully extended into an mm-hmm. object that it creates sensory phenomena in the owner of the object. So one of the things that was both ah. uh, painful and highly vulnerable is that when people would handle the um, beer steins, Jung would feel as if they were touching his physical body. Mm. So it was a very, very complicated wow. process of caring for the oh, beer steins. That often oh, but, uh, Jung wanted to only be the one who touched them. But there is, a, I guess, a slightly funny anecdote is that when Emma had really had enough of, of Jung, had just really needed to put him yeah. in his place, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she would go grab one of the beer steins and she would lick it with her nails really <laughs> aggressively wow. and Jung would cry out as oh, wow. if he was being struck wow. in the face and um it's a it's a bizarre thing I'm but gonna try that split. with my husband absolutely but uh it was effective <laughs> I mean we can understand why Emma was incredibly frustrated sure. from time sure. to time but it speaks to as we were saying before the way in which the um, Biersteins and Jung's body both had this um, interesting um, yeah. melding process. Right, in the kind of but, psychoidal level, right? right. Where that's exactly right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But that just, let's just back up a bit for our listeners of the psychoidal level as part of Jung's uh, theory that there is a place where matter and psyche mm-hmm. affect each other, where they yes. meet. And that doesn't sound so radical today, but it was pretty radical then. And um, let's also sort of uh, unpack the idea of synesthesia a little Mm -hmm. more, because that is a neurological fact, uh, and that some people, uh, when they see numbers, for example, uh, see them in color. So the uh, the visual cortex and um, the cortex that can uh, conceive of numbers Again, somehow there's a crossover so that what we, most of us, perceive as separate sensory functions get conflated. And that's what you were talking about, Joseph, with the beer steins, is that, you know, they could embody the energy, the physical energy of, of touch so that Jung could, per, you know, sort of perceive it as a kind of almost a sort of a transmitter. Hello, listeners. I want to take just one minute to remind you about my upcoming women's fairy tale and yoga retreat. We have just a few tickets left. It is April 25th through April 28th in central Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful time of year to be there. It's a great group of women. We have a ton of fun. We hang out. We do yoga. We talk about fairy tales. We eat good food. Uh, We tell stories and share poems around the campfire. Uh, We do some dream incubation. It's a really great time. So if you're interested, pop on over to my website, lisamarciano.com, where you can read more about Women's Wellspring Retreat. Thanks. Right. So in that regard, he would um, optically, he would Mm -hmm. visually see Emma smacking the beer stein, but that would be translated as a kinesthetic sensory experience as if the body was being struck in some way and that kind of really Mm -hmm. angry flicking motion that Mm -hmm. she would uh, regularly Mm -hmm. deliver you know in order to to punish him i suppose one way or another of course the other uh, more erotic dimension is that it, it was almost intolerable for him to watch their maid bathe any of the beer steins 
that mm. it felt as if his body was being stroked and it was it was deeply disturbing so there are mm. stories of him rushing over and grabbing the beer steins and kind of pushing her out of the way because it was just overwhelming right when she went and, after it with a feather duster for example exactly anything yeah. like that that <laughs> delicate touching of the beer steins it was just uh, overwhelming to him kinesthetically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you know, we've been talking about the psychological uh, connection with the beer steins, but there was a kind of more mundane use that he put the beer steins to. And of course, this did involve allowing other people to touch them. So he was, he was very careful about who he did this mm -hmm. with, but he would regularly use them uh, to engage in drinking contests. Mm. So, for example, you know, mm. he would pour a stein for himself and maybe one for Marie Louise von Franz, and you know, then they'd you'd have they'd have to chug and see who finished first. And some of those beer steins were huge. Yes, they were enormous. <laughs> yes, and uh, apparently, wow. Um, wow, he really he liked to challenge Marie Louise von Franz to a drinking contest, and she hated it. But yeah. she felt she couldn't say no because she always lost and apparently she couldn't really hold her, her liquor. But, you know, this was a serious kind of dominance uh, behavior in a way. And, you know, there are stories of him doing it with Freud and uh, with, other, with other colleagues and, and rivals. Mm -hmm. a, a kind of a, a gotcha thing where you hand somebody a beer stein that mm -hmm. can hold you know, 20 or 24 ounces of beer. And somebody who's fairly petite, like Marie-Louise von yeah. Franz, <laughs> yeah. uh, d didn't have a chance. Um, so it, there was a real challenge, a real challenge there. I, I wonder when um, Freud and Jung visited, uh, you know, which stein he handed Freud. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Freud was also not a large man, and Jung was a very large man. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're going to induce um, a, a change in state and summon the unconscious, uh, mm -hmm. no better way than to offer somebody a stein full of many, many ounces of beer. You know, you know who could drink young under the table, though, and was always game for Never. It was, it was Ruth. What was her last name, Deb? Ruth, um, was it Ruth Perkins? You know? Yeah, she was the one who went with young... Uh, to Africa, yes. she was a very yeah, exactly. She was a she very a practical very close friend, right? And she was very, very practical, very caretaking. She was mm -hmm. a nurse. She was a nurse. Yeah. Uh, Jung's children visited and spent the summer with her, mm -hmm. and he valued her for her her groundedness, right. her mm -hmm. no nonsense attitude, her you know sort of physical sensate hardiness. And, and she, she could drink. She, she could. She could. She could put it, it back. away. She yeah, could yeah, put yeah. Her away. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that, that was nice. At least it was somebody that could actually, once in a while, take him down mm -hmm. a peg or two. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, drink him under the table. Mm -hmm. Although, I tell you, I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall to see what Jung was like when he was really tipsy and the kinds of stuff that he would disclose and. Uh, the kind of hijinks he would get into. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that would have been a lot of fun and probably embarrassing. I'm sure that's why the family doesn't talk too much about it. Right. <laughs> so Jung and the objects. Mm -hmm. So we started by talking about how he would go into the kitchen. He would address oh. his pots and pans <laughs> and he would have a rather elaborate uh, morning breakfast in that way. So we know that he was particularly attached to his beer steins. We know that he was talking to his pots and his pans. And one of the things that um, Jung was particularly fascinated by was a small toaster um, that he mm -hmm. would use. Um, of course, there were electric toasters, but this was a kind of toaster where the bread would be cut, it would be leaned inwards, and then uh, a small amount of coal would be placed underneath it so that it would be kind of near the hearth, but it would be part of the toasting process. And he had a pet name for it, Gemutli, hmm. a little Gemutli, which uh, basically, hmm. I think in German, I apologize for mispronouncing it, just means the warm one, hmm. the toasty ah. one. Hmm. So ah. 
<laughs> yes, it's so sweet. And so mm-hmm. while the um, while the uh, toaster was was doing its things, Jung would sing a little song to it, and uh, be kind of fascinated by the whole alchemical process of toasting. Mm. And mm. of course, when we think about the idea of the alchemical process, getting things just right. Yeah. 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 The right temperature, the right closeness to the fire, not right. too it, much. Or it you burns have to pay attention. Ever. That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, too it, little, it doesn't work. It's, it's absolutely like, the alchemical yeah, attitude yes. of you don't just mix things together. No. You have to attend. You have to put mm-hmm. soul into the process. Yeah. So he would talk to Gamutli and mm-hmm. would coach it. Not sure which gender it was, but would coach it to make sure that it didn't toast too much mm. or too little. Mm-hmm. And then, if uh, the toast would burn, that Jung would scold Gamutli. I mean, severely. Oh. <laughs> there are stories of people just hearing him cursing mm. a blue streak and accusing Gamutli of ruining the toast, which goes to the whole scapegoat archetype, you know, it to does. lay your sins okay. upon uh. the toaster. And then he would banish it. Sometimes he would put it outside uh, near the wood pile for several days uh, to banish it from Bollingen. And sometimes there would be a rapprochement, and Gamutli would have to offer some kind of a small gift in order to be returned to the kitchen and into the company of the other pots and pans. The whole redemption cycle here. Uh, mm-hmm. But I kind of like that um, the relationship with these objects could include conflict. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, right, right. Uh, that, that he could uh, play out this whole thing of the banishment, the scapegoating, and then the return and the redemption. It's really sweet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I like that a lot. You know, and I'm also thinking about, of course, toasting is, isn't it the perfect thing to do? Uh, Because then you ingest the bread, the staff of life Mm -hmm. as, as toast, which, you know, why do we toast bread? Because uh, it adds texture and flavor and delight. It's so archetypal. Oh, that's it's, arch- it. Really yeah. is. It's yeah. And you're doing it. Jung was doing it literally at the hearth. Mm. You know, we we forget in modern life that the kitchen was the hearth, yeah. the heart of the home. So mm-hmm. you right. know, these so idiosyncrasies evokes- are loaded, loaded with meaning. And it evokes myth and fairy tales. It's just so profound. Yes, it's and smoothly. your sourdough bread baking, Lisa. I yeah. was thinking about the same thing <laughs> we were talking earlier. Yeah. But, um, I like the idea of the naughty toaster. Yeah. yeah. And I have started um, actually looking at my own toaster really differently. Yeah. And uh, when it burns the toast, I cannot tell you how unbelievably gratifying it is to blame the toaster hmm. and to really give it a, a good scolding. <laughs> and give it hell, you know, yeah. and and it's really become this wonderfully ambivalent, almost devilish yeah. object in my own kitchen. You know, it yeah. eats things up. Sometimes it burns it. It has an almost devilish, yeah. satanic uh, quality to it. And yeah. so I, I've been leaning into that feeling, mm. uh, wow. of course, as we all do admire Jung's creativity. And I have to, I have to say that. Really letting your toaster be alive. And it's really, really doing something hold, for you. Uh-huh. Holding yeah. it responsible. Uh-huh. Because so many things in your kitchen are just totally irresponsible. Oh, well, I like that a lot you know? of, of granting it autonomy. Yes. Uh, which is so in keeping with Jung's theory of the unconscious that it has its own creativity, its own direction, its own, its own energy. But you're also alluding, I think, very much to the archetype of the trickster. That if oh, the like toaster that. has autonomy, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it burns the toast. Mm-hmm. Right, because other things are, you, it's in your hand, like the pot's in your hand, the spoon's right. in your hand. But the toaster, you're helpless, man. You just put that toast in yeah, and you back away and 
just as you said, right. might work, might burn it, might come out doughy and not enough. So yeah. there is this weird feeling of autonomous intelligence mm. in the trickster that's yes. invested into the toaster. Yes. You know what that reminds me of? I, if you've ever read Marie Louise von Franz talk about why so many fairy tales have to do with the miller or the miller's daughter, mm -hmm. it's because, you know, in a medieval society, everyone did something by kind of the sweat of their labor. If you were a farmer or you were a blacksmith, but the miller was tricky because he relied on mm -hmm. usually it was water power and he didn't really have to do anything so that's kind of the significance so this really reminds me of that joseph that it's there's so, there is something tricky about kitchen appliances the mm -hmm. spirit in the bottle yeah you know, like yeah. the spirit yeah, in the yeah. toaster yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well i think this has been quite an intense experience i I certainly hope that people are feeling comfortable with this new information. On one level, it seems rather harmless and playful. On another level, you know, it, uh, it lets us know about Jung's vulnerabilities. You know, it needing really to deepens our understanding of the man and ah. his work. The idea of him cuddling the bear, Stein, yeah. and, feeling, Angela, and feeling so deeply attached to that, and uh, Gamutli, the toaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that he lived in a very magical world. Yeah, yeah, he was living a symbolic life where things were ensouled and yeah. <laughs> had autonomy and he could have a relationship with them. I think it's actually very moving. Oh, Dad, that's so beautiful the way you said that. Uh -huh. Yeah. The depth uh -huh. of feeling. Yes, yeah. definitely. And that it's there for all of us in everything we do and touch every day including the toaster. Mm -hmm. and, and Joseph, I'm wondering, if would you feel comfortable just saying a little bit more about how having that kind of relationship with your toaster has changed you? Well, it's made, it's made the whole process of, um, because I don't keep the uh, toaster on the counter, oh. that I actually, um, it lives in the cabinet because it has a little bit too much of an influence you know, once you begin to feel like your appliances are talking to you, you really have to titrate your exposure to them. Mm. So there's a oh. special cabinet, particularly in my house in North Carolina, and uh, I keep it in a small metal tray, once again, to contain it, because mm. I do have this feeling that it may, um, I know this sounds so strange, but there are times I feel like I have found it in other locations, so it has to be kind of contained in a small steel um, pan, like a catering pan. So I kind of slide it out only when I mm. really want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I put it on the counter and plug it in. And then as soon as I have a sense that the electricity is moving through the toaster, I, I begin to feel in a kind of Frankenstein way that suddenly the, there's a quality of life that yes, ha absolutely. has come into the toaster. Yeah. And I have tried to start with a negotiation before I offer it any bread. We try to iron it out. You know, does it feel like it's in a good mood? Do I feel like it's going to mis, you know, mistreat the bread? Mm. Oh, but I Do like I that. It's important to establish, it's always important to establish a kind of rapport rather than it's so tempting for the ego to just feel like it's dominant. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it relativizes mm. my own cooking arrogance because oh, I can my. feel, you know, when I'm making toast, I, I know this is confessional, but I feel kind of godlike. It, there's something about commanding the butter, the jam, the peanut butter sometimes that has a certain inflating dynamism. And mm. I think that goes back to my only mm -hmm. early childhood and being able to command my grandmother to make me um, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, mm -hmm. yeah, that kind yeah, of high chair tyrant mm -hmm. energy. But so when I do it for myself, I feel mm -hmm. that it's, it's dangerously yeah. inflated. Okay. Yeah. But I like very much how you have uh, compensated for these feelings by the respect that you are showing for the toaster that that it does need to be contained, and it does need to be consulted. There, it is a collaborative process, and it's not just one of 
you know, I'm in charge, I'm putting the bread in. It's really infused with a, a depth uh, and a symbolic resonance that I find incredible. And, and, and Joseph, talking about, you know, inflation, I can totally see that, right? Because with mm -hmm. the, I mean, if you think about what a toaster is, like most essentially, it's like we are commanding the central fire. You know, Jung said oh my this gosh. beautiful thing. Oh, that's about, important. You know, he's putting mirrors wow. around the central fire and the central fire is sort of like the self. And, and, and there it is in this little contained countertop unit, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think it absolutely is inflating to have that kind of power. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and then there's a certain responsibility. Like mine has little buttons on the side, you know, bagels, defrosting, uh, thick, toast and then there's mm -hmm. another dial to make it you know hotter or less hot right and so there there is there is this kind of interfacing process that i also feel responsible for but i have to tell you i have i'll think that i've got the settings right and the next thing i know i turn around smoke <laughs> is pouring out of the toaster Whoa. yeah and you're and then, you're in calcin audio and we are Whoa. at it, man. The kind of arguments that the toaster and I yeah. have, no one should have to hear that kind of language from right. their from a toaster. The things, yeah. it's out of control. It's out of control. But, but Lisa's right. That's calcinatio. Absolutely. Where, where the dross, otherwise known as an accumulation of breadcrumbs, you know, the dross has been unattended to. Mm -hmm. and and so needs true, so right? true and it's just it's really shadow it's the shadow of the bread that drops down below and ignites because why we haven't seen the shadow we haven't paid attention to the shadow and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden there it is in this incredible dramatic scary way with smoke pouring out of the toaster well and, and it reminds me that also one of my most intimate experiences with uh, Toasty mm -hmm. is that uh, I have to. Is that uh, its name, by the way? It, it's Toasty. Like an inter Toasty is the intermediary name. I know there is some other much more mythic mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. name sure. that I haven't. I, I'm listening, but um, Still when I. Shrouded it, in mystery. It is. Mm -hmm. uh, bring it over to the sink. And then, you know, there's that little catch tray in the, in mm -hmm. the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then just ever so. Subtly sliding it out, you know, very gently, and tapping the crumbs out, mm -hmm. maybe cleaning it out a little bit, and then it just sliding back in there. Mm -hmm. It's like changing its diaper. Hmm. Oh my God. What a and fascinating there, metaphor. And it has, a, there's a warmth in that experience where if I do it gently and I'm kind of humming a little bit, mm. that the toaster seems happy mm. just seems happy it and really... maybe that's the point of it all yeah well we're so grateful to Jung for pointing the way right mm. that we could have this kind of relationship with inanimate objects in particular the toaster right and in particular but i'm thinking about how Jung and you know countless others toasted bread over the fire or over a coal Mm -hmm. And that it took personal involvement. You have to hold the bread and get it just so. And how, what you're bringing to us, Joseph, is that that same quality of relationship and reverence mm. can be brought to a modern day toaster. And so many people just drop the bread in, you know, hit a button and forget about it. But you're, you're bringing that kind of sensitivity at, just as Jung did you know, toward your toast making today. And it's possible for everyone to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that is the message that yeah, Jung I think has so led, too. He's led the way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and has empowered me to experiment with mm -hmm. the uh, objects in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping to expand that so I have a greater sense of community among the various mm -hmm. appliances mm -hmm. in my kitchen, mm -hmm. some of which I've recently purchased. And I've not introduced to the toaster, but I believe that that's forthcoming. Okay. And, and mm -hmm. it yeah. makes me feel closer to Jung because that's the whole point. Yes. Yeah. I would never have really thought of something like that, but 
But, but for young. But for young. Right. So for young. And when we offer this um, special episode in in gratitude to young. And so from all of us to all of you. April Fools! Fools. (laughs) (laughs) We hope you enjoyed our funny romp through (laughs) totally ridiculous that come to us. And Uh, and it's so much fun to play. (laughs) It's so much fun to play. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.